Maison Tellier by Guy de Maupassant. They went there every evening about 11 o'clock, just as they would go to the club. Six or eight of them, always the same set, not fast men, but respectable tradesmen, and young men in government or some other employ, and they would drink their chartreuse and laugh with the girls or else talk seriously with Madame Tellier, whom everybody respected, and then they would go home at 12 o'clock. The younger men would sometimes stay later. It was a small, comfortable house painted yellow at the corner of a street behind St. Etienne's church, and from the windows one could see the docks full of ships being unloaded, the big salt marsh, and rising beyond it, the Virgin's Hill with its old gray chapel. Madame Tellier, who came of a respectable family of peasant proprietors in the department of the Eure, had taken up her profession, just as she would have become a milliner or a dressmaker. The prejudice, which is so violent and deeply rooted in large towns, does not exist in the country places in Normandy. The peasant says, It is a paying business, and he sends his daughter to keep an establishment of this character, just as he would send her to keep a girl's school. She had inherited the house from an old uncle, to whom it had belonged. Monsieur and Madame Tellier, who had formerly been innkeepers near Yateau, who had immediately sold their house as they thought that the business at Ficamp was more profitable, and they arrived one fine morning to assume the direction of the enterprise, which was declining on account of the absence of the proprietors. They were good people enough in their way, and soon made themselves liked by their staff and their neighbors. Monsieur died of apoplexy two years later, for as the new place kept him in idleness and without any exercise, he had grown excessively stout, and his health had suffered. Since she'd been a win widow, all of the frequenters of the establishment made much of her. But people said that personally she was quite virtuous, and even the girls in the house could not discover anything against her. She was tall, stout, and affable, and her, and her complexion, which had become pale in the dimness of her house, the shutters of which were scarcely ever opened, shone as if it had been varnished. She had a fringe of curly false hair, which gave her a juvenile look that contrasted strongly with the ripeness of her figure. She was always smiling and cheerful, and was fond of a joke but there was a shade of reserve about her, which her occupation had not quite made her lose. Coarse words always shocked her, and when any young fellow who had been badly brought up called her establishment a hard name, she was angry and disgusted. In a word, she had a refined mind, and although she treated her women as friends, she very frequently used to say that she and they were not made of the same stuff. Sometimes during the week she would hire a carriage and take some of her girls into the country, where they used to enjoy themselves on the grass by the side of the little river. They were alike a lot of girls let out from school, and would run races and play childish games. They had a cold dinner on the grass, and drank cider, and went home at night with a delicious feeling of fatigue, and in the carriage they kissed Madame Tellier as their kind mother, who was full of goodness and complaisance. The house had two entrances. At the corner, there was a sort of tap room which sailors in the lower orders frequented at night, and she had two girls whose special duty it was to wait on them with the assistance of Frederick, a short, light-haired, beardless fellow, as strong as a horse. They set the half-bottles of wine and the jugs of beer on the shaky marble tables before the customers, and then urged the men to drink. The three other girls, there were only five of them, formed a kind of aristocracy, and they remained with the company on the first floor, unless they were wa wanted downstairs and there was nobody on the first floor. The Salon de Jupiter, where the tradesmen used to meet, was papered in blue and embellished with a large drawing representing Lida and the Swan. The room was reached by a winding staircase through a narrow door opening on the street, and above this door a lantern enclosed in wire, such as one still sees in some towns at the foot of the shrine of some saint, burned all night long. The house, which was old and damp, smelled slightly of mildew, at times there was an odor of eau de cologne in the passages, or sometimes from a half-open door downstairs, the noisy mirth of the common men sitting and drinking rose to the first floor, much to the disgust of the gentlemen who were there. Madame Tellier, who was on friendly terms with her customers, did not leave the room, and took much interest in what was going on in the town, and they regularly told her all the news. Her serious conversation was a change from the ceaseless chatter of the three women. It was a rest from the obscene jokes of those stout individuals who every evening indulged in the commonplace debauchery of drinking a glass of liqueur in company with common women. The names on the girls on the first floor were Fernanda, Raphael, and Rosa, the Jade. As the staff was limited, Madame had endeavored so that each member of it should be a pattern, an epitome of the feminine type, so that every customer might find as nearly as possible the realization of his ideal. 
Fernanda represented the handsome blonde. She was very tall, rather fat and lazy, a country girl who could not get rid of her freckles, and whose short, light, almost colorless, toe-like hair, like combed-out hemp, barely covered her head. Raphael, who came from Marseille, played an indispensable part of the handsome Jewess, and was thin with high cheekbones, which were covered with rouge and black hair covered with pomatum, which curled on her forehead. Her eyes would have been handsome if the right one had not had a speck in it. Her Roman nose came down over a square jaw, where two false upper teeth contrasted strangely with the bad color of the rest. Rosa was a little roll of fat, nearly all body with very short legs, and from morning till night she sang songs, which were alternately risque or sentimental, in a harsh voice. She told silly interminable tales, and only stopped talking in order to eat, or left off eating in order to talk. She was never still and was active as a squirrel, in spite of her embonpant and her short legs. Her laugh, which was a torrent of shrill cries, resounded here and there ceaselessly in a bedroom, in the loft, in the cafe, everywhere, and all about nothing. The two women on the ground floor, Lotus, was na nicknamed La Coquette, and Flora, whom they called Balancoise, because she limped a little, the former always dressed as the goddess of liberty, with a tricolored sash, and the other as a Spanish woman, with a string of copper coins in her carroty hair, which jingled at every uneven step, looked like cooks dressed, like, dressed up for the carnival. They were all like other women of the lower orders, neither uglier nor better looking than they usually are. They looked just like servants at an inn, and they were generally called the two pumps. A jealous peace, which was, however, very rarely disturbed, reigned among these five women, thanks to Madame Tellier's conciliatory wisdom, and to her constant good humor, and the establishment, which was the only one of the kind in the little town, was very much frequented. Madame Tellier had succeeded in giving it such a respectable appearance, she was so amiable and obliging to everybody. Her good heart was so well known that she was treated with a certain amount of consideration. The regular customers spent money on her and were delighted when she was especially friendly towards them. And when they met during the day, they would say, well, until this evening, you know where, just as men say, at the club after dinner. In a word, Madame Tellier's house was somewhere to go to, and they very rarely missed their daily meetings there. One evening towards the end of May, the first arrival, Monsieur Poulain, who was a timber merchant and had been mayor, found the door shut. The lantern behind the grating was not alight. There was not a sound in the house. Everything seemed dead. He knocked gently at first, but then more loudly. But nobody answered the door. Then he went slowly up the street, and when he got to the marketplace, he met Monsieur Duvert, the gunmaker, who was going to the same place. So they went back together, but did not meet with any better success. But suddenly they heard a loud noise close to them, and on going round the house, they saw a number of English and French sailors who were hammering at the closed shutters of the taproom with their fists. The two tradesmen immediately made their escape, but a low pst stopped them. It was Monsieur Tourneveau, the fish curer, who had recognized them and was trying to attract their attention. They told him what had happened, and he was all the more annoyed as he was a married man and the father of a family, and he only went on Saturdays. That was his regular evening, and now he should be deprived of this dissipation for the whole week. The three men went as far as the quay together, and on the way they met young Monsieur Philippe, the banker's son, who frequented the place regularly, and Monsieur Pinapes, the collector, and they all returned to the Rue Ajoïs together to make a last attempt. But the exasperated sailors were besieging the house, throwing stones at the shutters and shouting, and the five first-floor customers went away as quickly as possible and walked aimlessly about the streets. Presently they met Monsieur Dupuis, the insurance agent, and Monsieur Vass, the judge of the Tribunal of Commerce, and they took a long walk, going to the pier first of all, where they sat down in a row on the granite parapet and watched the rising tide. And when the promenaders had sat there for some time, Monsieur Tonerval said, Well, this is not very amusing. Decidedly not, Monsieur Pinapes replied, and they started off to walk again. After going through the street alongside the hill, they returned over the wooden bridge which crosses the retinue, passed close to the railway, and came out again on the marketplace, when suddenly a quarrel arose between Monsieur Pinapes, the collector, and Monsieur Tonneval about an edible mushroom which one of them declared he'd found in the neighborhood. As they were out of temper already from having nothing to do, they would very probably have come to blows if the others had not interfered. Monsieur Pinapes went off furious, and soon another altercation arose between the ex-mayor, Monsieur Poulain, 
and Monsieur Dupuy, the insurance agent, on the subject of the tax collector's salary and the profits which he might make. Insulting remarks were freely passing between them, when a torrent of formidable cries was heard, and the body of sailors who were tired of waiting so long outside a closed house came into the square. They were walking arm in arm, two and two, and formed a long procession, and they were shouting furiously. The townsmen hid themselves in a doorway, and the yelling crew disappeared in the direction of the abbey. For a long time they still heard the noise, which diminished like a storm in the distance, and then silence was restored. Monsieur Poulain and Monsieur Dupuy, who were each angry with each other, went in different directions, without wishing each other goodbye. The other four set off again, and instinctively went in the direction of Madame Tellier's establishment, which was still closed, silent, impenetrable. A quiet but obstinate drunken man was knocking at the door of the lower room, and stopped and called Frederick in a low voice, but finding he got no answer, he sat down on the doorstep and waited the course of events. The others were just going to retire when the noisy band of sailors reappeared at the end of the street. The French sailors were shouting the Marseillaise, and the Englishmen rule Batania. There was a general lurching against the wall, and then the drunken fellows went on their way toward the quay where a fight broke out between the two nations, in the course of which an Englishman had his arm broken and a Frenchman his nose split. The drunken man who had waited outside the door was crying by that time, as drunken men and children cry when they're vexed, and the others went away. By degrees, calm was restored in the noisy town. Here and there at moments, the distant sound of voices could be heard, and then died away in the distance. One man only was still wandering about, Monsieur Tourneval, the fish cure, who was annoyed at having to wait until the following Saturday, and he hoped something would turn up, but he didn't know what. But he was exasperated at the police for thus allowing an establishment of such public utility, which they had under their control, to be closed. He went back to it and examined the walls, trying to find some reason, and on the shutter he saw a notice stuck up. He struck a wax match and read the following in large, uneven hand. Closed on account of confirmation. Then he went away, as he saw it was useless to remain and left the drunken man lying on the pavement fast asleep outside that inhospitable door. The next day, all the regular customers, one after the other, found some reason for going through the street with a bundle of papers under their arm to keep them in countenance, and with a furtive glance, they all read that mysterious notice, closed on account of the confirmation. Madame Tellier had a brother who was a carpenter in their native place, Virvel, in the department of Ure. When she still kept the inn at Yvetot, she st had stood godmother to that brother's daughter, who had received the name of Constance, Constance Rive, she herself being a Rive on her father's side. The carpenter, who knew that his sister was in a good position, did not lose sight of her, although they did not meet often, for they were both kept at home by their occupations, and lived a long way from each other. But as the girl was twelve years old and going to be confirmed, he seized that opportunity to write to his sister, asking her to come and be present at the ceremony. Their old parents were dead, and as she could not well refuse her goddaughter, she accepted the invitation. Her brother, whose name was Joseph, hoped that by dint of showing his sister's attention, she might be induced to make her will in the girl's favor, as she had no children of her own. Her sister's occupation did not trouble his scruples in the least, and besides, nobody do any, knew anything about it in Vervel. When they spoke of her, they only said, Oh, well, Madame Tellier is living at Fécamp, which might mean that she was living on her own private income. It was quite twenty leagues from Fécamp to Vervel, and for a, a peasant, twenty leagues on land is as long as a journey as crossing the ocean would be to city people. The people at Vervel had never been further than Rouen, and nothing attracted the people from Fécamp to a village of five hundred houses in the middle of a plain, and situated in another department. At any rate, nothing was known about her business. But the confirmation was coming on, and Madame Tellier was in great embarrassment. She had no substitute, and did not at all care to leave her house even for a day, for all the rivalries between girls upstairs and those downstairs would infallibly break out. No doubt Frederick would get drunk, and when he was in that state, he would knock anybody down for a mere word. At last, however, she made up her mind to take them all with her, with the exception of the man to whom she gave a holiday until the next day but one. When she asked her brother, he made no objection, but undertook to put them up for the night. And so on Saturday morning, the eight o'clock express carried off Madame Tellier and her companions in a second-class carriage. For as far as Beauville, they were alone, and chatted like magpies, but at that station a couple got in. 
The man, an old peasant, dressed in a blue blouse with a turned-down collar, wide sleeves tied at the wrist, ornamented with white embroidery, wearing an old high hat with a long nap, held an enormous green umbrella in one hand and a large basket in the other, from which the heads of three frightened ducks protruded. The woman, who sat up stiffly in her rustic finery, had the face like a fowl, with a nose that was pointed as a bill. She sat down opposite her husband and did not stir, as she was startled at finding herself in such smart company. There is certainly an array of striking colors in the carriage. Madame Tellier was dressed in blue silk from head to foot and had on a dazzling red imitation French cashmere shawl. Fernanda was puffing in a Scotch plaid dress, of which her companions had laced the bodice as tight as they could, forcing up her full bust that was continually heaving up and down. Raphael, with a bonnet covered with feathers so that it looked like a bird's nest, had on a lilac dress with gold spots on it, and there was something oriental about it that suited her Jewish face. Rosa had on a pink skirt with largo flounces and looked like a very fat child, or an obese dwarf, while the two pumps looked as if they'd cut their dresses out of old flowered curtains dating from the Restoration. As soon as they were no longer alone in the compartment, the ladies put on staid looks and began to talk of subjects which might give others a high opinion of them. But a bull a gentleman with light whiskers, a gold chain and wearing two or three rings got in, and put several parcels wrapped in oilcloth on the rack over his head. He looked inclined for a joke and seemed like a good-hearted fellow. "'Are you ladies changing your quarters?' he said, and that question embarrassed them all considerably. Madame Tellia, however, quickly regained her composure and said sharply to avenge the honor of her corps. "'I think you might try and be polite.' He excused himself and said, "'I beg your pardon. I ought to have said your nunnery.' She could not think of a retort, so perhaps thinking she'd said enough, Madame gave him a dignified bow, bow and compressed her lips. Then the gentleman who was sitting between Rosa and the old peasant began to wink knowingly at the ducks, whose heads were sticking out of the basket, and when he felt that he'd fixed the attention of his public— he began to tickle them under the bills and spoke funnily to them to make the company smile. We've left our little pond, quack quack, to make the acquaintance of the little spit, quack quack. The unfortunate creatures turned their necks away to avoid his caresses, and made desperate efforts to get out of their wicker prison, and then suddenly all at once uttered the most lamentable quacks of distress. The women exploded with laughter. They leaned forward and pushed each other so as to see better. They were very much interested in the ducks, and the gentleman redoubled his airs, his wit, and his teasing. Rosa joined in, and leaning over her neighbor's legs, she kissed the three animals on the head, and immediately all the girls wanted to kiss them in turn, and as they did so, the gentleman took them on his knee, jumped them up and down, and pinched their arms. The two peasants, who were even in greater consternation than their poultry, rolled their eyes as if they were possessed, without venturing to move, and their old wrinkled faces had not a smile, not a twitch. Then the gentleman, who was a commercial traveler, offered the ladies suspenders by a way of a joke, and taking up one of his packages, he opened it. It was a joke, for the parcel contained garters. There were blue silk, pink silk, red silk, violet silk, mauve silk garters, and the buckles were made of two gilt metal cupids embracing each other. The girls uttered exclamations of delight, and looked at them with that gravity natural to all women when they're considering an article of dress. They consulted one another by their looks or in a whisper, and replied in the same matter, and Madame Tellier was longingly handling a pair of orange garters that were broader and more imposing-looking than the rest, really fit for a mistress of such an establishment. The gentleman waited, for he had an idea. "'Well, come, my kittens,' he said. "'You must try them on.' There was a torrent of exclamations, and they squeezed their petticoats between their legs, but he quietly waited his time and said, "'Well, if you will not try them on, I shall pack them up again.' And he added cunningly, I offer any pair they like to those who will try them on. But they would not, and they sat up very straight and looked dignified. But the two pumps looked so distressed that he renewed his offer to them, and Flora especially visibly hesitated, and he insisted, Come, my dear, a little courage. Just look at that lilac pair. It will suit your dress admirably. Well, that decided her, and pulling up her dress, she showed a thick leg fit for a milkmaid, in a badly fitting coarse stocking. The commercial traveler stooped down and fastened the garter. When he'd done this, he gave her the lilac pair and asked, "'Who's next?' "'I! I!' they all shouted at once, and he began on Rosa, who uncovered a shapeless round thing without any ankle, a regular sausage of a leg, as Raphael used to say. Lastly, Madame Tellier herself put out her leg, a handsome, muscular Norman leg, and in his surprise and pleasure, the commercial traveler gallantly took off his hat to salute that master calf, like a true French cavalier. 
The two peasants who were speechless from surprise glanced sideways out of the corner of one eye, and they looked so exactly like fowls that the man with the light whiskers when he sat up said, Cocorico, under their very noses, that gave rise to another storm of amusement. The old people got out at Mottville with their basket, their ducks, and their umbrella, and they heard the women say to their husband as they went away, They are no good and are off to that cursed place, Paris. The funny commercial traveler got himself out at Rouen, after behaving so coarsely that Madame Tellier was obliged sharply to put him in his right place, and she added as a moral, Well, this will teach us not to talk to the first comer. At Ocelle they changed trains, at a little station further on, Monsieur Joseph Rivet was waiting for them with a large cart with a number of chairs in it, drawn by a white horse. The carpenter politely kissed all the ladies and then helped them into his conveyance. The three of them sat on three chairs at the back, Raphael, Madame Tellier, and her brother on the three chairs in front, while Rosa, who had no seat, settled herself as comfortably as she could on tall Fernandez's knees, and then they set off. But the horse's jerky trot shook the cart so terribly that the chairs began to dance and threw the travelers about, to the right and to the left, as if they were dancing puppets, which made them scream and make horrible grimaces. They clung on to the sides of the vehicle. Their bonnets fell on their backs, over their faces, and on their shoulders. And the white horse went on stretching out his head and holding out his little hairless tail like a rat's, with which he whisked his buttocks from time to time. Joseph Rivet, with one leg on the shafts and the other doubled under him, held the reins in his elbows very high, and kept uttering a kind of clucking sound, which made the horse prick up his ears and go faster. The green country extended on either side of the road, and here and there the colza and flower presented a waving expanse of yellow, from which rose a strong, wholesome, sweet, and penetrating odor, which the wind carried to some distance. The cornflowers showed their little blue heads amid the rye, and the women wanted to pick them, but Monsieur Rivet refused to stop. Then sometimes a whole field appeared to be covered with blood, so thick were the poppies, and the cart, which looked as if it were filled with flowers of a more brilliant hue, jogged on through the fields bright with wildflowers, and disappeared behind the trees of a farm, only to reappear and go on again through the yellow or green standing crops, which were studded with red or blue. One o'clock struck as they drove up to the carpenter's door. They were tired out and pale with hunger, as they had eaten nothing since they had left home. Madame Rivet ran out and made them a light one after another, and kissed them as soon as they were on the ground, and she seemed as if they would never tire of kissing her sister-in-law, whom she apparently wanted to monopolize. They had lunch in the workshop, which had been cleared out for the next day's dinner. The capital omelet, followed by boiled chitterlings and washed down with good hard cider, made them all feel comfortable. Rivet had taken a glass so that he might drink with them, and his wife cooked, waited on them, brought in the dishes, took them out, and asked each of them in a whisper whether they had everything they wanted. A number of boards standing against the walls and heaps of shavings that had been swept into the corners gave out a smell of planed wood, the smell of a carp carpenter's shop, that resinous odor which penetrates to the lungs. They wanted to see the little girl, but she'd gone to church and would not be back again until evening, so they all went for a stroll in the country. It was a small village through which the high road passed. Ten or a dozen houses on either side of the single street were inhabited by the butcher, the grocer, the carpenter, the innkeeper, the shoemaker, and the baker. The church was at the end of the street and was surrounded by a small churchyard, and four immense lime trees which stood just outside the porch shaded it completely. It was built of flint, in no particular style, and had a slate-roofed steeple. When you got past it, you were again in the open country, which was varied here and there by clumps of trees which hid the homesteads. Rivet had given his arm to his sister out of politeness, although he was in his working clothes and was walking with her in a dignified manner. His wife, who was overwhelmed by Raphael's gold-striped dress, walked between her and Fernanda, and Roly-Poly Rosa was trotting behind with Louise and Flora, the seesaw, who was limping along, quite tired out. The inhabitants came to their doors, the children left off playing, and a window curtain would be raised so as to show a muslin cap, while an old woman with a crutch who was almost blind crossed herself as if it were a religious procession, and they all gazed for a long time at those handsome ladies from town, who had come so far to be present at the confirmation of Joseph Rivet's little girl, and the carpenter rose very much in the public estimation. As they passed the church, they heard some children singing. Little shrill voices were singing a hymn, but Madame Tellier would not let them go in, for fear of disturbing the little cherubs. After the walk during which Joseph Rivet enumerated the principal landed proprietors, spoke about the yield of the land and the productiveness of the cows and sheep, he took his tribe of women home and installed them in his house, 
and as it was very small, he had to, they had to put them into rooms, two and two. Just for once, Rive would sleep in the workshop on the shavings. His wife was to share her bed with her sister-in-law, and Fernand and Raphael were to sleep together in the next room. Louise and Flora were put into the kitchen where they had a mattress on the floor, and Rosa had a little dark cupboard to herself at the top of the stairs, close to the loft, where the candidate for confirmation was to sleep. When the little girl came in, she was overwhelmed with kisses. All the women wished to caress her with that need of tender expansion, that habit of professional affection which had made them kiss the ducks in the railway carriage. Each of them took her on her knees, stroked her soft light hair, and pressed her in their arms with vehement and spontaneous outbursts of affection. And the child, who was very good and religious, bore it all patiently. As the day had been a fatiguing one for everybody, they all went to bed soon after dinner. The whole village was wrapped in that perfect stillness of the country, which is almost like a religious silence. And the girls who were accustomed to the noisy evenings of their establishment felt rather impressed by the perfect repose of the sleeping village. And they shivered, not with cold, but those little shivers of loneliness which come over uneasy and troubled hearts. As soon as they were in bed, two and two together, they clasped each other in their arms as if to protect themselves against this feeling of the calm and profound slumber of the earth. But Rosa, who was alone in her little dark cupboard, felt a vague and painful emotion come over her. She was tossing about in bed, unable to get to sleep when she heard the faint sobs of a crying child close to her head through the partition. She was frightened and called out, and was answered by a weak voice, broken by sobs. It was the little girl who was always used to sleeping in her mother's room and who was afraid in her small attic. Rosa was delighted, got up softly so as not to waken anyone, and went and fetched the child. She took her into her warm bed, kissed her and pressed her to her bosom, lavished exaggerated manifestations of tenderness on her, and at last grew calmer herself and went to sleep. Until morning, the candidate for confirmation slept with her head on Rosa's bosom. At five o'clock, the little church bell, ringing the Angelus, woke the women who usually slept the whole morning long. The villagers were up already, and the women went busily from house to house, carefully bringing short, starched muslin dresses or very long wax tapers tied in the middle with a bow of silk fringed with gold and with dents in the wax for the fingers. The sun was already high in the blue sky, which still had a rosy tint towards the horizon like a faint remaining trace of dawn. Families of fowls were walking about outside the houses, and here and there a black cock with a glistening breast raised his head, which was crowned by his red comb and flapped his wings and uttered his shrill crow, which the other cocks repeated. Vehicles of all sorts came from neighboring parishes, stopping at the different houses, and tall Norman women dismounted, wearing dark dresses with kerchiefs crossed over the bosom, fastened with silver brooches a hundred years old. The men had put on their blue smocks over their new frock coats or over their old dress coats of green cloth, the two tails of which hung down below their blouses. When the horses were in the stable, there was a double line of rustic conveyances along the road. Carts, cabriolets, tilburies and wagonettes, traps of every shape and age, tipping forward on their shafts or else tipping backward with the shafts up in the air. The carpenter's house was as busy as a beehive. The women in dressing, Jackets and petticoats with their thin short hair, which looked faded and worn and hanging down their backs, were busy dressing the child, who was standing quietly at a table, while Madame Tellier was directing the movements of her battalion. They washed her, did her hair, dressed her, and with the help of a number of pins, they arranged the folds of her dress and took in the waist, which was too large. Then when she was ready, she was told to sit down and not to move, and the women hurried off to get ready themselves. The church bell began to ring again, and its tinkle was lost in the air like a feeble voice which is soon drowned in space. The candidates came out of the houses and went towards the parochial building which contained two schools and the mansion house, and which stood quite at one end of the village while the church was situated at the other. The parents in their very best clothes followed their children with embarrassed looks and those clumsy movements of a body bent by toil. The little girls disappeared in a cloud of muslin which looked like whipped cream, while the lads who looked like embryo waiters in a cafe and whose heads shone with pomatum walked with their legs apart so as not to get any dust or dirt on their black trousers. It was something for a family to be proud of when a large number of relatives who'd come from a distance surrounded the child and the carpenter's triumph was complete. Madame Tellier's regiment with its leader at its head followed Constance. Her father gave his arm to his sister her mother walked by the side of Raphael, Fernando with Rosa and Louise and Flora together, and thus they proceeded majestically through the village, like a general staff in full uniform, with the effect of the village was startling. 
At the school, the girls ranged themselves under the Sisters of Mercy and the boys under the schoolmaster, and they started off, singing a hymn as they went. The boys led the way in two files, between the two rows of vehicles, from which the horses had been taken out, and the girls followed the same order. And as all the people in the village had given the town ladies the precedence out of politeness, they came immediately behind the girls, and lengthened the double line of the procession still more, three on the right and three on the left, while their dresses were as striking as a display of fireworks. When they went into the church, the congregation grew quite excited. They pressed against each other, turned round and jostled one another in order to see, and some of the devout ones spoke almost aloud, for they were so astonished at the sight of those ladies whose dresses were more elaborate than the priest's vestments. The mayor offered them his pew, the first one on the right, close to the choir. Madame Tellier sat there with her sister-in-law, Ferdinand and Raphael. Rosa, Louise, and Flora occupied the second seat in company with the carpenter. The choir was full of kneeling children, the girls on one side and the boys on the other, and the long wax tapers which held looked like lances pointing in all directions. And the three men were standing in front of the lectern, singing as loud as they could. They prolonged the syllables of the sonorous Latin indefinitely, holding on to amens with interminable A's, which the reed stop of the organ sustained in a monotonous, long, drawn-out tone. A child's shrill voice took up the reply, and from time to time, a priest sitting in a stall and wearing a beretta got up, muttered something, and sat down again, while the three singers continued, their eyes fixed on the big book of plain chant lying open before them on the outstretched wings of a wooden eagle. Then silence ensued, and the service went on. Toward the close, Rosa, with her head in both hands, suddenly thought of her mother, her village church, and her first communion. She almost fancied that the day had returned, when she was so small it was almost hidden in her white dress, and she began to cry. Well, first of all, she wept silently, and the tears dropped slowly from her eyes, but her emotion increased with her recollections, and she began to sob. She took out her pocket handkerchief, wiped her eyes, and held it to her mouth so as not to scream, but it was in vain. A sort of rattle escaped her throat, and she was answered by two other profound heartbreaking sobs, for her two neighbors, Louise and Flora, who were kneeling near her, overcome by similar recollections, were sobbing by her side amid a flood of tears. And as tears are contagious, Madame Tellier soon in turn found that her eyes were wet, and turning on to her sister-in-law, she saw that all the occupants of her seat were also crying. Soon throughout the church, here and there, a wife, a mother, a sister, seized by the strange sympathy of poignant emotion, and affected at the sight of those handsome ladies on their knees, shaken with sobs, was moistening her cambric pocket handkerchief and pressing her beating heart with her left hand. Just as the sparks from an engine will set fire to dry grass, so the tears of Rosa and her companions infected the whole congregation in a moment. Men, women, old men and lads in new smocks were soon all sobbing, and something superhuman seemed to be hovering over their heads. A spirit, the powerful breath of an invisible, an all-powerful being. Suddenly a species of madness seemed to pervade the church, the noise of a crowd in a state of frenzy, a tempest of sobs and stifled cries. It came like gusts of wind which blow the trees in a forest, and the priest, paralyzed by emotion, stammered out incoherent prayers without finding words, ardent prayers of the soul soaring to heaven. The people behind him gradually grew calmer. The cantors, in all dignity of their white surplices, went on in somewhat uncertain voices, and the reed stop itself seemed hoarse, as if the instrument had been weeping. The priest, however, raised his hand to command silence, and went and stood on the chancel steps when everybody was silent at once. After a few marks on what had just taken place, in which he attributed to a miracle, he continued, turning to the seats where the carpenter's guests were sitting. I especially thank you, my dear sisters, who have come from such a distance, and whose presence among us, whose evident faith and ardent piety have set such a salutary example to all. You have edified my parish. Your emotion has warmed all hearts. Without you, this great day would not, perhaps, have had this really divine character. It is sufficient at times that there should be one chosen lamb for the Lord to descend on his flock. His voice failed him again from emotion, and he said no more, but concluded the service. They now left the church as quickly as possible. The children themselves were restless and tired with such prolonged tension of the mind. The parents left the church by degrees to see about dinner. There was a crowd outside, a noisy crowd, a babel of loud voices where the shrill Norman accent was, dis was discernible. The villagers formed two ranks, and when the children appeared, each family took possession of their own. 
The whole houseful of women caught hold of Constance, surrounded her and kissed her, and Rosa was especially demonstrative. At last she took hold of one hand, while Madame Tellier took the other, and Raphael and Ferdinand held up her long muslin skirt so that it might not drag in the dust. Louise and Flora brought up the rear with Madame Rivet, and the child, who was very silent and thoughtful, set off for home in the midst of this guard of honor. Dinner was served at the workshop on long boards supported by trestles, and through the open door they could see the enjoyment that was going on in the village. Everywhere there was feasting, and through every window were to be seen tables surrounded by people in their Sunday best, and a cheerful noise was heard in every house, while the men sat in their shirt sleeves, drinking glass after glass of cider. In the carpenter's house the gaiety maintained somewhat of an air of reserve, the consequence of the emotion of the girls of the morning, and Rivet was the only one who was in a jolly mood and he was drinking to excess. Madame Tellier looked at the clock every moment, for in order not to lose two days running, they must take the 355 train, which would bring them to Fee Camp by dark. The carpenter tried very hard to distract her attention so as to keep his guests until the next day. But he did not succeed, for she never joked when there was business on hand, and as soon as they'd had their coffee, she ordered her girls to make haste and get ready. And then, turning to her brother, she said, "'You must put in the horse immediately.' and she herself went to finish her last preparations. When she came down again, her sister-in-law was waiting to speak to her about the child, and a long conversation took place, in which, however, nothing was settled. The carpenter's wife was artful and pretended to be very much affected, and Madame Tellier, who was holding the girl on her knee, would not pledge herself to anything definite, but merely gave vague promises. She would not forget her, there was plenty of time, and besides, they would meet again. But the conveyance did not come to the door, and the women did not come downstairs. Upstairs they even heard loud laughter, romping and little screams and much clapping of hands. And so while the carpenter's wife went to the stable to see whether the cart was ready, Madame went upstairs. Rive, who was very drunk, was plaguing Rosa, who was half choking with laughter. Louise and Flora were holding him by the arms and trying to calm him, as they were shocked at his levity after that morning's ceremony. But Raphael and Ferdinand were urging him on, writhing and holding their sides with laughter, and they uttered shrill cries at every rebuff the drunken fellow received. Well, the man was furious, his face was red, and he was trying to shake off the two women who were clinging to him, while he was pulling Rosa's skirt with all of his might and stammering incoherently. But Madame Tellier, who was very indignant, went up to her brother, seized him by the shoulders, and threw him out of the room with such violence that he fell against the wall in the passage. And a minute afterward, they heard him pumping water on his head in the yard. And when he reappeared with the cart, he was quite calm. They started off in the same way they had come the day before, and the little white horse started off with his quick dancing trot. Under the hot sun, their fun, which had been checked during dinner, broke out again. The girls now were amused at the jolting of the cart, pushed their neighbor's chairs, and burst out laughing every moment. There was a glare of light over the country which dazzled their eyes, and the wheels raised two trails of dust along the high road. Presently, Ferdinand, who was fond of music, asked Rosa to sing something, and she boldly struck up the gros cure de Moudin. But Madame Tellier made her stop immediately, as she thought it a very unsuitable song for such a day, and she added, Sing us something of Beranger's. And so after a moment's hesitation, Rosa began Beranger's song, The Grandmother, in her worn-out voice, and all the girls and even Madame Tellier herself joined in the chorus. How I regret my dimpled arms, my nimble legs, and vanished charms. Well, that is first rate, Rive declared, carried away by the rhythm, and they shouted the refrain to every verse while Rive beat time on the shaft with his foot, and with the reins on the back of the horse, who as if he himself were carried away by the rhythm, broke into a wild gallop and threw all the women in a heap on top of one another on the bottom of the conveyance. Well, they got up laughing as they were mad, and the gong went on, shouted at the top of their voices, beneath the burning sky among the ripening grain, to the rapid gallop of the little horse, who set off every time the refrain was sung, and galloped a hundred yards to their great delight, while occasionally a stonebreaker by the roadside sat up and looked at the load of shouting females through his wire spectacles. When they got out at the station, the carpenter said, I'm sorry you're going. We might have had some good times together. But Madame Tellier replied very sensibly, Everything has its right time, and we cannot always be enjoying ourselves. And then he had a sudden inspiration. Look here, I'll come and see you at Ficamp next month. And he gave Rosa a roguish and knowing look. Come, his sister replied, you must be sensible. You may come if you like, but you're not to be up to any of your tricks. He did not reply, and as they heard the whistle of the train, he immediately began to kiss them all. 
When it came to Rose's turn, he tried to get to her mouth, which she, however, smiling with her lips closed, turned away from him each time by a rapid movement of her head to one side. He held her in his arms, but he could not attain his object, as his large whip which he was holding in his hand and waving behind the girl's back in desperation interfered with his movements. "'Passengers for Wuhan, take your seats,' the guard cried, and they got in. There was a slight whistle, followed by a loud whistle from the engine, which noisily puffed cut at its jet of stream while the wheels began to turn a little with visible effort, and Rive left the station and ran along by the track to get another look at Rosa. And as the carriage passed him, he began to crack his whip and to jump, while he sang at the top of his voice, How I regret my dimpled arms, my nimble legs, and vanished charms. And then he watched a white pocket handkerchief which somebody was waving as it disappeared in the distance. They slept the peaceful sleep of a quiet conscience until they got to Rouen, and when they returned to the house, refreshed and rested, Madame Tellier could not help saying, It was all very well, but I was longing to get home. They hurried over their supper, and then when they'd put on their usual evening costume, waited for the regular customers, and the little colored lamp outside the door told the passers-by that Madame Tellier had returned, and in a moment the news spread. Nobody knew how or through whom. Monsieur Philippe, the banker's son, even carried his friendliness so far as to send a special messenger to Monsieur Tourneveau, who was in the bosom of his family. The fish cure had several cousins to dinner every Sunday, and they were having coffee when a man came in with a letter in his hand. Monsieur Tourneveau was much excited. He opened the envelope and grew pale. It contained only these words in pencil. The cargo of cod has been found. The ship is coming to port. Good business for you. Come immediately. He felt in his pockets and gave the messenger two sons and then son two sous, and then suddenly blushing to his ears, he said, Oh, I must go out. He handed his wife the laconic and mysterious note, rang the bell, and when the servant came in, he asked her to bring him his hat and overcoat immediately. As soon as he was in the street, he began to hurry, and the way seemed to him to be twice as long as usual, in consequence of his impatience. Madame Tellier's establishment had put on quite a holiday look. On the ground floor, a number of sailors were making a deafening noise, and Louise and Flora drank with one and the other and were being called in for every direction at once. The upstairs room was full by nine o'clock. Monsieur Vasse, the judge of the Tribunal of Commerce, Madame Tellier's regular but platonic wooer, was talking to her in a corner in a low voice, and they were both smiling as if they were about to come to an understanding. Monsieur Paulin, the ex-mayor, was talking to Rosa, and she was running her hands through the old gentleman's white whiskers. Tall Fernando was on the sofa, her feet of the coat of Monsieur Pinapes, the tax collector, and leaning back against young Monsieur Philippe, her right arm around his neck, while she held a cigarette in her left hand. Raphael appeared to be talking seriously with Monsieur Dupuy, the insurance agent, and she finished by saying, Yes, I will, yes. Just then the door opened suddenly, and Monsieur Tourneval came in, and was greeted with the enthusiastic cries of, Long live Tourneval! and Raphael, who was dancing alone up and down the room, went and threw herself into his arms. He seized her in a vigorous embrace, and without saying a word, lifted her up as if she'd been a feather. Rosa was chatting to the ex-mayor, kissing him and puffing, both his whiskers at the same time in order to keep his head straight. Fernanda and Madame Tellier re remained with the four men, and Monsieur Philippe explained, I will pay for some champagne. Get three bottles, Madame Tellier. And Fernanda gave him a hug and whispered to him, Play us a waltz, will you? So he rose and sat down at the old piano in the corner and managed to get a hoarse waltz out of the depths of the instrument. The tall girl put her arms around the tax collector. Madame Tellier let Monsieur Vass take her round the waist, and the two couples turned round, kissing as they danced. Monsieur Vass, who had formerly danced in good society, waltzed with such elegance that Madame Tellier was quite captivated. Frederic brought the champagne. The first cork popped, and Monsieur Philippe played the introduction to a quadrille, Though which, through which the four dancers walked in society fashion decorously, with propriety and deportment, bows and curtsies, and then they began to drink. Monsieur Philippe next struck up a lively polka, and Monsieur Tourneval started off with the handsome Jewess, whom he held without letting her feet touch the ground. Monsieur Pinapes and Monsieur Vasse had started off with renewed vigor, and from time to time one or another couple would stop to toss off a long draught of sparkling wine, and that dance was threatening to become never-ending, when Rosa opened the door. I want to dance, she exclaimed, and she caught hold of Monsieur Dupuy, who was sitting idle on the couch, and the dance began again. But the bottles were empty. I will pay for one, Monsieur Tourneveau said. So will I, Monsieur Vass declared. And I will do the same, Monsieur Dupuy remarked. 
They all began to clap their hands and soon it became a regular ball. And from time to time, Louise and Flora ran upstairs quickly and had a few turns while their customers downstairs grew impatient. And then they returned regretfully to the tap room. At midnight, they were still dancing. Madame Tellier let them amuse themselves while she had long private talks in corners with Monsieur Vass, as if to settle the last details of something that had already been settled. At last, at one o'clock, the two married men, Monsieur Tonneval and Monsieur Pinipes, declared that they were going home and wanted to pay. Nothing was charged for except the champagne, and that cost only six francs a bottle instead of ten, which was the usual price. And when they expressed their surprise at such generosity, Madame Tellier, who was beaming, said to them, well, we don't have a holiday every day.